Welcome to this Thursday edition of Go There on Fourth. Today we make our game, or wow, game for a week for game picks. I share with you my terrible fantasy football advice uh, and maybe whatever else is going on today. I don't know. But happy Thursday, everybody. I hope you're getting ready for Thursday night football. Um, I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, a.k.a. the Root Path Pastor, and this is Go There on Fourth. All right, so far on the season, I have a 27-21 and 21 record of game picks, which is a 56% correct rate. So I, I'm up 3% from the beginning of the season. So that's that's really good, moving in the right direction. I'm going to jump right into my game picks, starting with the Thursday night football game, the Lions versus the Packers. The Lions are a different team under Co Coach Campbell. Uh, they look amazing. They look tougher. They look grittier. Uh, the defense even playing better in, in spots, but they're playing against the Packers in Lambeau, and I am I believe in Jordan Love enough. And I, I believe in Jordan Love enough to put Brock Purdy on the trade block in my fantasy football league. So that's how much I believe in Jordan Love. And that's why I'm that's why I'm picking the Packers over the Lions tonight on Thursday night football. Sunday morning. Now, now if you're a fantasy football player, this is an important note that you need to keep track of the Falcons and Jaguars play on Sunday but they play at 9 30 a.m eastern time they, because they're playing over in London uh, so remember to set your lineups and do so before going to church okay that way you're not pulling your phone out uh, during the service and as your pastor's preaching or the worship set um, or you could bless your pastor by just you know giving a hand signals or come up with a, a code to let him know how his players are doing, if he has players on those teams in the league, if he's in the league with you. Um, or just hold up scorecards, right, for him as the game's going along. I don't know. Uh, no, but bless your pastor by being in church. Don't skip it for, to watch football. Uh, you can uh, and, and try and pay attention. Uh, but anyway, Falcons versus Jaguars. That's going on at 9.30 a.m., starting at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. So, again, I'm just reemphasizing with that, those of us playing fantasy football so we can remember to set our lineups uh, beforehand. Uh, and I, I'm picking the Jaguars in this one. Uh, I, there's a lot to like about the Falcons defensively. They're, they're a gritty team. Uh, I just I think the Jags are coming off that bad loss to the Texans last week. And they're going to find some way to get it done. Dolphins versus the Bills. Um, the Dolphins are one of three teams that are undefeated. They absolutely obliterated the Broncos last week 70-20. to they have one of the smartest young coaches in the game. But I'm picking the Bills. The Bills at home over the Dolphins. Uh, yes, the Bills have kind of struggled over, over the beginning three weeks of the season. But last week, well, the first two weeks especially, but last week they kind of looked like themselves again on both offense and, and defense. I do not think there's going to be a big part point margin in this one. I think this is going to be a good old-fashioned slugfest. Um Maybe more of an offensive slugfest than a defensive one, uh, but I, I think the Bills are going to, are going to win this one and give the Dolphins their first L of the season. Ravens versus the Browns, another defensive matchup. I, I'm picking the Browns. Uh, the Colts slowed down the Ravens' rushing attack enough to win the game last week, and I think the Browns can do the same thing. I think they can put pressure on Lamar. I think they can force him to use his legs more, um, and but I, I think they also have the front to be able to, to shut down the running game. So uh, this will be an interesting game to watch. Uh, I can't remember the last time I've picked the Browns more than once in a season, but here we are. I'm picking the Browns on Sunday. Bengals versus the Titans. I'm still not confident in the Bengals' offense, but we saw signs of life the other night. Uh, uh, yes, Burrow's playing on one leg, but I, I, I'm still picking the Bengals over the Titans this week. The Titans are a mess on offense right now, and the Bengals' defense is looks really good. So I'm thinking the Bengals in this one. Rams versus the Colts. And I am really excited about this game for my Colts. I'm picking the Colts. But again, this week is not just because I'm a Colts fan. I pick them every week. But it's also because I really believe that they have a good chance to win this game. Again, we just watched the Bengals sack staffer. I think it was five or six times. I can't remember the exact number. They, they got two interceptions out of it. And I think the Colts can put just as much pressure on Matthew Stafford in this one. Um... So I'm, I'm anxious to, to see this game play out, but I'm picking the Colts over the Rams. Buccaneers versus the Saints. I'm picking the Saints. Even if even if the Saints are without Derek Carr, um, 
Now, I did see that he was in the facility, according to one report. I don't know if that means he's playing or if he's just there to be moral support. We don't know. But I do like the Saints regardless. I think the Saints' defense is going to be trouble for the Buccaneers' offense. Even though, I mean, last week aside, Mayfield struggled a little bit against the Eagles. But Mayfield's been off to a hot start. Mike Evans had an unbelievable catch in that last game. Uh, on top of all the other incredible catches he's had so far this season, um, but I, I like the Saints in this divisional ma- other divisional matchup. Lots of division matchups this week. Uh, Commanders versus the Eagles. Picking the Eagles. I mean, for some reason, I I was tempted to go with the Commanders. They're that, that young, scrappy team. I, they're coming off a bad loss to the Bills last week. I don't think Sam Howell's going to throw four interceptions in a game again. Again, it's his first season as the starter, so that's, that's pretty common. Um, but I'm going to go with the Eagles in this. I just think the Eagles' defense is going to be too much for that young offense, that young quarterback. Uh, and then offensively, they just keep finding ways to grind it out and get get the W. So I'm picking the Eagles in it. Vikings versus the Pan- Panthers. Picking the Vikings. I think Kirk Cousins is playing way too well uh, to keep losing. It's crazy that he is 0-3 and putting up all the numbers that he has put up. I think he's going to get a W this week. Uh, Steelers versus the Texans. Uh it's T.J. Watt versus a rookie quarterback. Now, although I will say uh, C.J. Stroud has looked has been playing better each week. He looked a lot more confident last week against the Jaguars. Um, I just I think the Steelers are going to have just a little bit more. Uh, they're going to find that some, find some way to limit the big plays, get some turnovers, some takeaways, uh, and find a way to win the game. So. This is a Christian podcast about faith football and fantasy football, and I always like to share a brief devotional as part of this pod, uh, a, a part of this of go there and forth. Uh, and today I'm going to look at this something that's a, kind of a troubling part of our culture. I don't know if it's just I've gotten older and I've noticed it more, or social media has just simply amplified uh, this fact about us as people, as a society. Um, but we live in an impatient culture. We want instant everything. We want to be able to push search on Google and have all the results pop up instantly. And for some of us, that's not enough. Like we ask Siri, so Siri goes and gets it and gets the, the, the direct results we want right away. Uh, we want to be able to put our, our, you know, snap our fingers and have our food at, at the ready. You know, instant meals, instant oatmeal, right? That's what we're after. And it, when it comes to football, we look at players, rookie quarterbacks especially, really, and really any rookie at any position in football, and and we, we expect them to come from the college ranks, start playing in the NFL immediately, and immediately be plugged in and be good. Have it all figured out, have all the answers, not make any mistakes, and play perfect football. And when they don't do that, our immediate reaction is, well, get that guy out of He's terrible. Well, get that guy out of there. He's, he's hurting us. He's not helping us. Help Get that kid out of there. He's not that good. Those are things we say. Or look at look at the, the Broncos last week, right? They, 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 they traded to get Sean Payton as their coach. Uh, he's just, you know, he's known for taking the Saints and Drew Brees to the Super Bowl and two times, right? No, one time. Beating the Colts in two thousand in the in the Super Bowl, supposed to be this brilliant guy. So they bring him in to try and help out and fix Russell Wilson. And what happens? They lose by fifty points last week, and they're zero and three on the season. And, and so many people are just saying, "Well, look, we 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 paid all this money, we gave up all this capital to get Sean Payton in there, and look where we're at now. It's not gotten us anywhere. He's a dud. He's lost his you know all these comments they make about Sean Payton." Without, but people are making that comment, not realizing, not thinking about the fact that the Broncos got to the spot that they're in over a lot longer time frame than what Sean Payton's been there. Yet they bring Sean Payton in and they expect Sean Payton to immediately turn the ship around, immediately go, you know, start winning games, become a playoff team, and go to the Super Bowl. They want those results now. But that, that's just not the reality. And, and even, I, I, you know, all the hype surrounding Deion Sanders in the, in the Colorado program in, in college football, right? He got off to that hot, that hot 3-0 start. 
and then they go up against Oregon, and, and Oregon is a really good football team, coached really well, and they absolutely obliterate Colorado. What's the, what are the, what are the comments? Well, see, I told you. See, Dion, he's not going to cut it. See, Dion and, the, and, the, and, the, and those Colorado Buffalo, they're just not that good, right? And, and that's after one loss. He started off undefeated. He beat TCU. Yes, TCU is rebuilding, but he's, he beat TCU. Uh, yes, they, they struggled against Colorado State, but they still found a way to win the game. And we're talking about a program that I think only won one game last year. And they started off 3-0, and but after losing one game, there's many in the media, there's many in, um, in the, on, on social media saying like, well, told you, he's not going to cut it, not good enough. After one loss... Not taking in any other factors into account. And here's the truth that we all we all know, but we don't want to acknowledge. Rarely is anything in life like fixing a car. Right? Say so something breaks on your car, and you take it into the mechanic, or you you take it in the backyard, right? And you, you and your buddies are out there with your tools in the shop, and you're you're working on it, getting ready to turn it. A three-hour job into a ten-hour job, but you're out there working on it. And when you work on a car, the idea is you go out and you figure out what parts broken, what, what cars making the engine not run correctly, or whatever it parts causing the problems. You go to the auto parts store, you buy that, the, buy a new part, you bring it, and you put it, you take off the old one, put the new part on, and then the car works perfectly. It works the way it's supposed to. That's a car. That's a machine. That's not a person. That's not an organization made up of people. Life isn't like that. You and I, we, we know that. We know life isn't like that, right? So often we, we know in our own personal lives that you know, we're trying to make changes. We're trying to, we're, we're trying to grow in the position where we're working at. We're trying to grow as, as an individual, right? And making better life choices and life decisions. We're trying to live a a holy life pleasing and acceptable to God, but but we understand that it's not an overnight instant success type thing. It's it's a process. Yeah, you know, I'm a Nazarene. I believe that the Holy Spirit can come and fill our hearts and sanctify us fully in a moment. But I also know that it takes a lifetime to undo the broken patterns of our mind. And so our hearts sanctified in a moment, but our minds are being sanctified as we journey through life. That's more than a moment. That's a lifetime of work and in, in, in constant being, being sensitive and walking in step with the Spirit. It's not an instant thing. But see, for some reason, when you and I, when we look at other people, and we, you know, these football players are an example, when we look at other people, we expect them to have it all figured out at once. We, we give ourselves the grace to learn and grow and, and overcome, but when we look at others, we don't do that. We expect them to be immediately where we're at or where we think they should be at. And as I was studying this, I, I, it reminded me of one of the parables of Jesus. And as I meditating on that thought, I, parables of Jesus in Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells this parable of the sower. And, and I'm just going to read it to you. It's Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through, uh, I'm not even sure. Uh, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, and the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. So other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop multiplying 36 or, or even 100 times. So this is a parable that Jesus shares, and he's going to go on a little bit to explain this to his disciples in private. Uh, but the idea is this farmer's walk around, he's scattering seeds, and that seed represents the, the word of God, right? And it, well, the, the, and what's expected of that seed is that it will fall and grow where it's planted. 
it's because again, if, if it's, the seed is the, the word of God, God's truth, and Jesus is the farmer in the story, going around scattering the seeds. He's not just God doesn't do things haphazardly. God does things with a plan and a purpose. So when God's scattering seeds, He's not just wasting seeds on the pathway. He's not just wasting seeds on these bad soil, these bad soils. He's throwing the seeds, still expecting that seed to grow where it's planted. Now, the growth of that seed, though, is very dependent upon where it lands at. Right? We, from reading that parable and hearing it preached before and studying it for ourselves, we know that, that it is difficult for a seed to grow on a pathway. We know it's difficult for a seed to grow in a rocky place or in a thorny spot. We know it's difficult for... For a seed to grow among the thorns. We know this. So sometimes the soil, through no fault of its own, sometimes through, through factors beyond the seed's control, there are elements that prevent the seed from taking root and growing. And what has to happen, but again, that doesn't change the will of the farmer. That doesn't change the purpose of planting the seed. What that means is the soil upon which the soil, fe- the soil the soil upon which the seed fell needs to be cultivated in order for the seed to be able to grow. And so, yes, some some are good soil. The seed falls in the soil and, and it grows and it spruits up, uh, spru- you know, shoots up immediately. No problem without a hitch. But so much of the time, the soil where the seed falls upon, it needs to, it needs to have the debris cleared away. It, it may have thorns there that need to be trimmed back. It may have rocks that need to be dug up, dug up and, and taken away. There's work that's required. See, you and I get that. We get that about our own selves. We can look at the soil and, and read this parable and think, well, if, I'm, if my heart's supposed to be the soil, I know I did not start off as good soil. I know the work that the Holy Spirit had to do in my life to make my heart open and receptive to the truth of God. To the truth of that, that Jesus loves me and Jesus has a plan for it. My heart had to be open and softened to be able to hear that. You see, that's where we have to be careful. We, have, we, we remember that about ourselves, but we have to learn to re- remember that about other people. Because when it comes to others, you and I aren't the soil in their story. They're, they are the soil in their story. Their heart is the soil upon which, which the truth has fallen, is taking root, and is supposed to grow. You and I, in their story, we're either the water, the cup of water, filled with the living water of Jesus Christ being poured out upon their soil for them to be able to grow. Or were the birds, or the thorns, or the rocks. Were the rocks that prevent them from getting deep roots and being able to, to grow up that way? Were the birds there that come and snatch them off the path before they even have a chance to go? Were the thorns that choke them out as they're trying to grow up? Why? Because we stop believing in them. We stop caring about them. As they're trying to learn and process and enjoy the journey and the process to getting better and getting to the place where they're supposed to be, we, our criticism, our harsh critiques, our giving up on a person, our us not respecting the process they're going through is a hindrance to their growth. No, what we need to do is understand that it's a process. Everything in life, we understand our spiritual life, it's a, it's a journey of grace. A football player starting their first season, they're going to make mistakes because there's a learning curve. It's not like Madden, right? It's real life, real life people breathing and blinking, having to learn how to play a game. Play a game where they, they're going from being the best on the field possibly to now they're one of 25 that are good. Or maybe the bottom of 25 that are good. 
Well, if you, if you enjoyed that devotion, be sure to, to, to visit ravnaz.com. That's where I'm the pastor at, the Ravenna Church of Naz- Nazarene. We're located at 530 Main Street in Ravenna, Kentucky. We have Sunday morning worship service at 1045 a.m. Eastern Time. We would love to have you join us if you live in the Esto County area or you're passing through on a trip. Stop in, join us, worship with us. If you'd like to join us online, we, have, we, have, we do live stream our services every week. And you can also catch the sermon on the Dirt Past Sermon Podcast. All right, let's continue on with my game picks. I got a little long-winded there, but that's what happens when you're talking with a pastor about Jesus. All right, the Sunday afternoon games. We have the Raiders versus the Chargers. I'm picking the Chargers in this one, but however, if Garoppolo is hurt and he cannot play, do not be shocked if the backup quarterback for the Raiders steps in and you see a bit of a spark in that offense. He had a great preseason. He comes from a system that throws the ball all the time. He's coming from a program that produced Drew Brees. Okay, so keep that in mind. Again, I still don't think the Raiders will win, but I do think that, and I still pick the Chargers, but do not be surprised if, if, the, if Aiden comes in and puts up some, some interesting numbers. Patriots versus the Cowboys. Logic says pick the Cowboys. I'm picking the Patriots. I don't have a good reason, but there's just something about the way the Cowboys lost last week to the Cardinals, and and you could think they would come in and and play fired up and angry about it, and and they very well might. I know the Patriots' offense isn't exactly explosive and dynamic, but there's just something about this matchup that I'm like, I I don't know, I'm picking the Patriots for some reason. So, Cardinals versus the 49ers. I do know why I'm picking the Cardinals in this one. If, and if you don't, if you don't know why I'm picking the Cardinals, uh, go back and watch, listen to last week's episode or watch the video about my, my restitution I'm making to Cardinals fans. So for the remainder of this year, I am a Cardinals fan. I will pick them no matter who they're going against uh, because basically if they don't make the playoffs, I'm getting an ice bath at the end of the season. So I'm picking the Cardinals over the 49ers. Okay, maybe not because I believe, truly, but I, be- but I believe. All right. I, I, this, what's going on with my fantasy football team this week? I'm in a 12-team PPR league with some custom scoring with some church folks and friends. My team is 1-2. and two. We got in the win column last week. But this week I'm facing the defending co- or division champion. And he's currently ranked third in our power rankings. So this is going to be a tough matchup. So here's what my plan is. At quarterback, I'm going with Jordan Love. I said earlier, I, I feel confident enough that I've put Brock Purdy... I made him available for trade. Uh, Jordan Love's going against the Lions. But what has me excited, what has me confident in Jordan Love at this point is that fact that he actually outscored Brock Purdy last week. And Jordan Love was going against the Saints defense. And he was still found he still scored more fantasy points than Brock Purdy did. And Brock Purdy had a pretty good week last week. So that's what has me excited about Jordan Love. So I'm, I'm going to roll with him at, my, at QB this week. Running back one, I have Tony Pollard versus the Patriots. Again, this matchup versus the Patriots worries me for, for some reason, but it's, t- it's Tony Pollard, and he's one of those backs you just don't take out unless you absolutely have to. Running back two, I have Damian Pierce versus Pittsburgh. The Steelers have given up are giving up 130 yards rushing per game. So I'm sticking with Damian Pierce in this one at running back two. My receiver one is Amon Ross Amon Brown versus the Packers tonight. Now the Packers rank second versus receivers in fantasy scoring this year, so that's a they're, they're top ten against fantasy receivers. Uh, but I don't know that the Packers have necessarily faced an offense as strong as Detroit's yet. So uh, while that ranking is not necessarily the idea for a fantasy matchup, it's I'm on Ross St. Brown. I'm, he's my receiver one. I'm rolling with him. Receiver two, Jalen Waddle versus the Bills. Uh, he. At the time, as I was getting ready for this episode, he still had the big red Q for questionable next to his name. But the good news is he's been cleared. Uh, he's ready to go. Uh, he averages four receptions a game versus the Bills so far in his career. Probably about 70 yards, I think it is. I think he only has like one or two touchdowns. But again, he's going to get some attention in this game. Uh, tight end Mark Angels versus the Browns. Uh, I'm not thrilled about this matchup. I don't think this is a good matchup for Andrews. Uh, the Browns are like a, I think, third against opposing tight ends in fantasy f- football, uh, but I really don't ha- see any other better options. I have Najoku, but the Browns are just as tough against tight ends as the Browns are. 
So I don't see any upside by switching the two of them. Uh, and, and also in fairness, I don't know that the Browns have faced a tight end at the level of Mark Andrews yet. So I'm, it's a bit risky, but I'm, I'm just going to roll with Andrews and see what happens. At my flex, this is my biggest change. Man, remember, I've been rolling with Brees Hall all year, and he's kind of struggled. But today I traded away Brees Hall. I traded him away. I picked up uh, Michael Thomas from the Saints, and I picked up... Um, He's a running back for the Ravens. Can't think of his name right now. Uh, Gus Edwards. I picked up Gus Edwards from the Ravens. Pretty sure that's who it was. Uh, so, again, Brees Hall's been kind of a letdown. I figure the two pieces I picked up aren't exa- they're kind of they're kind of wishy-washy fantasy points wise. But I figure pull them in, make a move, and if one of them solidifies, awesome. If one of them doesn't, great. And the good news is I still have uh, Cooper Cup sitting on my on my IR spot. So at some point he's going to come back, and it's going to be a really big boost. So, but for this week at the flex, I'm rolling with Adam Thielen going against his old team, the Vikings. So far on the season, Adam Thielen has 25 targets and 20 catches. That's through three games. He is a favorite target in this offense, targeted by both by Bryce Young, or Bryce Young, and also too many. B names today. Uh, Bryce Young, he's been, and he was targeted by Andy Dalton last week. So whether Young or Dalton plays, I don't know that that changes the fact that Thielen's a focal point in that offense. And you got to think he's going against his former team, the Vikings. So there's got to be some some extra motivation there for him this week. So I'm going with Thielen at my flex spot. Bit of a gamble, especially the way our league's structured. You, you really, typically, you want to go with a, a third running back, but again. Uh, I, I just, bit risky move. I'm going against a team where I'm projected to lose anyway, so this is a bit of a gamble, and it may work, it may not. At defense, I dropped the Titans after last week. You know, they, they didn't do horrible, but they didn't do great. But I'm rolling with the Colts versus the Rams. Uh, again, the Rams just gave up a bunch of sacks to the Bengals, and I feel like the Colts have a better front, defensive front line than what the Bengals do. So... We'll see how that plays out, but I'm pretty excited about that matchup. And that kicker, I just, I'm just i still rolling with Nick Folk. Again, kicker's one of those things for me. Uh, unless I can real, see a real advantage to drop and make a change, I typically don't. And typically, it's the bye week is when I make my change. All right, continuing on with our game picks. Uh, but if you have any questions for me about fantasy football, uh, you want to call me stupid for my fantasy, do, leave, please leave a comment. Send me a message. Uh, you can find a, find a link tree somewhere on my Facebook page. You can send a message that way. Um, there's all kinds of ways to get in contact with me. But here's our primetime games for this week. For Sunday Night Football, it is the Chiefs versus the Jets. I'm picking the Chiefs. Although I do expect this to be closer than expected. Uh, outside of Travis Kelsey catching the football, who else will step up for the Chiefs? That, that seems to be the biggest question of the season. Yes, they played a little bit better last week, but can they do it a second week in a row against a very talented Jets defense? So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Seahawks versus the Giants. I'm picking the Seahawks. The Giants defense has been battered all season. Uh, and, uh, that's where I stand. So, all right, here are some players I like this week, and here are some players I don't like. I like Geno Smith versus the Giants. Again, the Giants have been beaten up all year on defense. Uh, they just, they've given up three passing touchdowns. I can't remember the yardage uh, off the top of my head, but I like this matchup for Geno Smith in the, in the Seahawks receiving core. I do not like Dak Prescott versus the Patriots. Yes, I know the last time they played, he put up 4, 445, 445 yards and three touchdowns. The last time they played the the Patriots, yes, I know that Mike McCarthy is one to go against Belichick as a, the coach of the Cowboys, but you, you know who also knows that? Bill Belichick. Running back, I like Jerome Ford versus the Ravens. If you watched the Colts and Ravens last week, again, many of us as Colts fans felt that if Anthony Richardson played in this game, they would have won by a lot more. But even then, Zach Moss ran the ball 30 times for 100 and I think it was over 130 yards. Well, maybe it was 120, somewhere in there. And Jerome Ford is on team with Deshaun Watson, who can scramble and move around for himself. 
And the Ravens have kind of struggled against the rushing, the running game this year. So I'm, I'm, I like Jerome Ford against the Ravens. I don't like Kyrene Williams versus the Colts. Again, the Colts defensive line is solid. Um, so I, I'd say clearly their receivers. I like, I love Jamar Chase versus the Titans. Again, why in the world would you take Jamar Chase out for any reason unless he's hurt? But anyway, I love this matchup for him against the Titans, and, and I'll tell you why. Cooper, Amari Cooper last week against the Titans had seven catches for 116 yards and a touchdown. And now you got Jamar Chase, and the Bengals have some other weapons that are you, you can't just solely focus on Chase the whole game. So that's going to free him up even more than when Amari Cooper did. And in fairness, Cooper probably should have had two touchdowns in that game. I don't like the Chiefs receivers versus the Jets. Mainly because, again, I don't know that any of the other receivers are... I just don't know which which one of them are going to step up on any given week. And I don't even will any of them will this week. Tight end, I like Ingram of the, on the Jaguars versus the Falcons. The Falcons have given up two touchdown passes to tight ends on the season and 18 catches. That's through three games. You know, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's your tight end. Outside of Travis Kelsey and Mike, Mike Mark Andrews and maybe a couple others this season, um, anytime you can get six catches out of your tight end in a game, you're doing all right, especially in a PPR league. Um, I, again, I've said this earlier when I was talking about my lap. I do not like Mark Andrews versus the Browns. Now, the Browns have only given up six receptions to a tight end on the season. Again, they have not faced a tight end the, to Mark Andrews' level. But even then, it makes me nervous. Defense. I love the Bengals versus the Titans. Remember, the Titans gave up six sacks last week to the Browns' defense. The Bengals just sacked Matt Stafford five times. I like this matchup. I don't like the Commanders versus the Eagles. I do like the, I, I like the Commanders as a young, scrappy team, but I definitely don't like them versus the Eagles. Um, so that's my players I like, I don't like for this week. If you have any questions about faith or fantasy football, again, please leave a message in the comments. Uh, use my link tree to send me a message. Use, use Messenger to send me a message. Use, send a Messenger pigeon to send me a message. Um, I'd love to chat with you. Uh, but until Tuesday... Happy fantasy football.